one of the central <coughs> tenets of the Christian faith is the fact of, of the resurrection and judgment. I don't know why I'm putting that back over there. I'm going to need this here in a minute. Uh, Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 27. The Hebrew writer tells us that it's appointed unto man to die once, but after this the judgment. In John chapter 5, verses 28 and 29, Jesus said that all who are in the graves would hear the voice of the Son of Man and come forth, those who have done good to the resurrection of life, those who have done evil to the resurrection of condemnation. So there is, there's going to be a resurrection. We're all going to die unless Jesus comes back, in which case if we're still alive and remain until he returns, as Paul says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, uh, in that case we'll be changed. But if he doesn't, we're going to die. And, and one of these days, there's going to be a resurrection and we're going to face judgment. And Jesus says there's going to be a reward, a resurrection of life. Uh, in John chapter 14, in the first three verses, as Jesus comforts his apostles there, in the night in which he was betrayed at the Last Supper, he tells them to let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. My Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go to prepare a place, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. So that's what waits for those who are good, those who have uh, served Jesus like we're supposed to. A place prepared where God is, and it's in heaven. Heaven's his throne and earth's his footstool. And God is in our Father who art in heaven, Jesus said when he gave him all the money. But there's a place prepared for punishment as well. Matthew chapter 25 and verse 46, as Jesus gives us a, a picture of the, of the judgment that is going to take place one of these days, he speaks of separating the sheep from the goats, the sheep being those who are righteous and the goats being those who are unrighteous. And he says that the goats are going to go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. Matthew chapter 25, verse 46. The goats are going to go away into, into eternal punishment. And that eternal word for eternal <coughs> there is the same word as the one for eternal life. It's the same Greek word. So as long as that life is going to be, that's how long the punishment is going to be. And that punishment, back in verse 41 of Matthew chapter 25, is an eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. And that's hell. Hell is, is real. Hell is not some myth, and it's not some uh, misconception that people gather from reading the Bible over these years. You know, even some who used to be gospel preachers ceased believing in hell and have ceased. Uh, in 1982, Ed Fudge wrote a book called The Fire That Consumes, where he argued that there is no, uh, there is no torment after this, there is no continuing torment after this life for the wicked. They cease to exist, they're annihilated. That was what he taught. But that's not what the Bible teaches us about hell. You know, and Jesus is the one who talked about hell more than anybody else in Scripture. And Jesus affirms that it is indeed real and that it is eternal. Turn with me to Matthew, the fifth chapter, in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 5. <clears throat> Jesus says in Matthew chapter 5, and verse 22, I say to you that whoever is angry with his brother without a call shall be in danger of the judgment, and whoever says to his brother Raka shall be in danger of the council, but whoever says you fool shall be in danger of hellfire. Hell fire, that eternal punishment that we just looked at in Matthew chapter 25, verses 29 and 30. Notice what Jesus says there. If your right eye causes you to sin, pluck it out and cast it from you, for it is more profitable for you that one of your members perish than for your whole body to be cast into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and cast it from you, for it is more profitable for you that one of your members perish than for your whole body to be cast into hell. Matthew chapter 10 and verse 28. In Matthew chapter 10 and verse 28, Jesus said, Do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul, but rather fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Look at Luke chapter 12 and verse 5. He says, But I will show you whom you should fear. Fear him who after he is killed has power to cast into hell. Yes, I say to you, fear him. Matthew chapter 18 and verse 9, Jesus there again says, If your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out and cast it from you. It is better for you to enter into life with one eye than rather than having two eyes to be cast into hell fire. 
as Jesus condemns the, the scribes and Pharisees for their hypocrisy. He says in Matthew chapter 23 and verse 33, Serpents, brood of vipers, how can you escape the condemnation of hell? Matthew chapter, Mark chapter 9 rather. Mark the ninth chapter, turn with me. Mark chapter 9 beginning in verse 42. Jesus said, But whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to stumble, it would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were thrown into the sea. If your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter into life maimed rather than having two hands to go to hell into the fire that shall never be quenched where their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. And if your foot causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter into life lame rather than having two feet to be cast into hell into the fire that shall never be quenched where their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. And if your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out. It is better for you to enter into the kingdom of God with one eye rather than having two eyes to be cast into hellfire where their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. That doesn't sound like temporary punishment to me. That is something that's permanent. It's eternal. The worm doesn't die. The fire is not quenched. And Jesus said, you don't want to go there. He uses hyperbole. He's not literally advocating that we start cutting off body parts. But what he's saying is it would be better to do that than it would be to go into hell. That's how serious of a matter it is. You don't want to go there. Luke the 16th chapter. In Luke the 16th chapter, we see the, the consciousness of those who are in torment. Luke the 16th chapter. Luke chapter 16, beginning in verse 19, there was a certain rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. There was a certain beggar named Lazarus, full of sores, who was laid at his gate, desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. So it was that the beggar died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. And being in torments and Hades, he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. Then he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember that in your lifetime you received your good things and likewise Lazarus evil things, but now he is comforted and you are tormented. And besides all this, between us and you there is great gulf fixed, so that those who want to pass from here you cannot, nor can those from there pass to us. Then he said, I beg you, therefore, Father, that you would send him to my father's house, for I have five brothers, that he may testify to them, lest they also come to this place of torment. Abraham said to him, They have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. And he said, No, Father Abraham, but if one goes to them from the dead, they will repent. But he said to him, If they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rise from the dead. Now we're not talking about the final place for the, the wicked. But what we see here is the fact that they are conscious. They are aware of what's going on in torment, waiting for that judgment day. Hades is the realm of the dead. You've got paradise and you've got torment. And that's where people go to wait for the judgment. We don't cease to exist when we die. And hell waits for those who are wicked. And so with it established that that hell is indeed a real place and that it is a place of punishment that will last for an eternity, we want to consider for just a few moments who will be there. Who is it that is going to populate hell? Well, the first thing that we'll notice is that the majority is going to be there. The majority of people who ever live on the face of this earth are going to end up in that place of torment. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 7, verses 13 and 14, Enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction, and there are many who go in by it. Because narrow is the gate and difficult is the way which leads to life and there are few who find it. The way that leads to death is broad and it's easy. It's the path of least resistance and that's what people tend to do is take that path of least resistance. The way that leads to life is narrow and difficult and there are going to be few who find it. And this is contrary to what many people believe when they consider God. Well, God is a loving God, and I just don't believe that God would send people to hell. I just don't believe it. Well, why don't you believe it? It's a lack of understanding. It's a lack of study. Romans chapter 11, Paul said, Consider the goodness and severity of God. 
It's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God, Hebrews chapter 10 teaches us. He is good and He is loving, but He is also just and He will punish those who have not taken advantage of the grace that He offers. And the majority are going to refuse. We also see that the devil and his angels are going to be there. Matthew chapter 25, verse 41. Back again where Jesus is giving us that picture of the, of the judgment that he's going to, to meet out in that great day. He will also say to those on the left hand, the goats. He's going to say, depart from me, you cursed, into the everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. The devil and his angels. Those angels that don't maintain their, their proper place, that are reserved in chains, is what the scriptures say. The devil is going to be there. For Revelation 20 and verse 10, the devil who deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast, the false prophet are, and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. The devil. The devil's also real. It doesn't seem like you would have to say that and establish that, but there are many who name the name of Christ who don't even believe that the devil is real. That he's just, they believe that he's just the personification of evil. But the devil is that serpent of old, we're told in the Revelation. He is that serpent of old. He is the one who did the deceiving. He's a real being. He walks about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour, 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 8 tells us. And this liar, John chapter 8 and verse 44, Jesus said the devil is a liar, he's the father of lies and a murderer. And has been from the beginning, he says. He's going to go to hell. The lake that burns with fire and brimstone has been prepared for him and his angels. And for all these unrighteous dead. The people that satisfy the lust of the flesh are also going to join the devil and his angels. And again, we talk about the majority going to be there. That's the problem. The majority of people are those that satisfy the lust of the flesh rather than restraining themselves as the scriptures command. Galatians chapter 5, verses 19 through 21. Paul says, Now the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, <clears throat> hatred, contentions, jealousies, Outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, murders, drunkenness, revelries, and the like, of which I tell you beforehand, just as I also told you in time past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. You know, that's a problem uh, for the uh, Calvinists out there. People that teach that there is no possibility of apostasy. You can't sow sin as to be lost. Because there are some who will continue in sin after they've heard the gospel and obeyed it. Paul in Romans chapter 6 has to argue against the idea that we ought to sin so that grace may abound. That was what some people accused him. Teach. But we are that one slave whom we obey of sin leading to death or of obedience leading to righteousness. And we can have an evil heart of unbelief and departing from the living God. And that evil heart of unbelief and departing from the living God is that evil heart that ceases to obey. Jesus said the wise man in Matthew chapter 7 is the one who hears and does what he says. He says back in verse 21, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, and he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Who did Paul write Galatians to? Christians. Christians. And what does he say there? Who is this warning for? It's for Christians. If we continue to live a lifestyle like that after we've named the name of Christ, we're going to lose our soul. We can inherit the kingdom. Same thing in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9 and 10. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. Can't live that way and go to heaven. People that satisfy the lust of the flesh are going to populate hell. People not in the Lord's body 
are going to go to hell. Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 23, Paul says, For the husband is head of the wife, as also Christ is head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. He's the head of the church and the Savior of the body. The church and the body are the same thing. Colossians 1.18, he is the head of the body, the church. So if he's the Savior of the body, he's the Savior of the church, if you're not in that body, if you're not in that church, then you are lost. You are outside that realm. That group that God predestined. Those who are elect. Again, not an individual thing. It is a corporate election. It is those who are in Christ. Ephesians chapter 1 tells us. That's how God chose to redeem us. It's in Christ. It is in his body, the church. That's where salvation is. 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 10. Therefore I endure all things for the sake of the elect, that they also may obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. Salvation is in Christ. Every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places is in Christ. Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 3. It's in his body. It's in the church. Galatians chapter 3 and verse 27 tells us how to get into Christ, where all these spiritual blessings are at, where salvation is at. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. It's through obedience to the gospel that we get into Christ. The Lord adds to the church daily such as should be saved. Acts chapter 2 and verse 47. People that are not in the Lord's body are going to populate hell. Lawless religious people are going to be in hell. The lawless religious will be in hell. Matthew chapter 7, again, verse 21. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Those who have acted, though they might be religious, if they have acted without authority, if they have gone beyond the doctrine of Christ, as 2 John verses 9 through 11 teaches, if they have done that, they will be lost. They will be told, depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. And so all these people that have set up their own religion, that have left the New Testament pattern that God left for us, they're lost. We have to have authority for what we do. We cannot act in a lawless way. Whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Colossians chapter 3 and verse 17. Good moral people are going to be in hell if they are outside of Christ, if they've never obeyed the gospel, yet they live good moral lives. Their morality is not going to save them. In Acts chapter 10, beginning in verse 1, we read the account of Cornelius. There was a certain man in Caesarea called Cornelius, a centurion of what was called the Italian regiment, a devout man and one who feared God with all his household, who gave alms generously to the people and prayed to God always. Now, if that's not moral, then I don't know what is. Verse 3 says, About the ninth hour of the day he saw clearly in a vision an angel of God coming in and saying to him, Cornelius. And when he observed him, he was afraid and said, What is it, Lord? So he said to him, Your prayers and your alms have come up for a memorial before God. Now send men to Joppa and send for Simon, whose surname is Peter. He is lodging with Simon a tanner. This good, moral, upstanding man who prayed to God always and gave, gave alms generously to the people, good moral man, needed to hear something from Peter. He will tell you what you must do. What you must do. Of course, then we read how Peter had the vision about the sheep coming down from heaven and was catching up all these animals and things in it, and he was told, rise, Peter, kill and eat. And he said, no, Lord, nothing unclean has ever entered my mouth. And he says, what I have cleansed, don't you call common. And Peter figured out that what he was talking about was people. Gentiles were amenable to the gospel just like Jews were. You look at chapter 10, verse 22. Cornelius, the centurion, a just man, one who fears God and has a good reputation among all the nations of Jews, was divinely instructed by a holy angel to summon you to his house and to hear words from you. 
Cornelius did what he was told to do. He sent for Peter. He sent for Peter, and Peter was told to come by the Spirit. And he did. The reason that that angel some had Peter summoned was so that he could share words with Cornelius and his household. Summon you to his house and to hear words from you. Acts chapter 10, verses 42 and 43. Jesus commanded us to preach to the people, Peter said, and to testify that it is he who was ordained by God to be judge of the living and the dead. To him all the prophets witness that through his name, whoever believes in him will receive remission of sins. You know Isaiah 59, 1 and 2 teaches us that our sin separates us from God. We can't go to heaven as long as that sin separates us from God. Hebrews 9.22, without shedding of blood, there's no remission. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 4, it's not possible for the blood bulls and goats to take away sin. It took the sacrifice of Jesus to take away sins. And we can't take advantage of that, or we, we don't take advantage of that, when we fail to obey the gospel. And so even if we live good, moral, upstanding lives, if we don't obey the gospel, our sins are not remitted. They're not taken away. Peter preaches the gospel to this moral, upright man and commands him in verses 47 and 48. It says, Can anyone forbid water that these should not be baptized who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have? And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. Then they asked him to stay a few days. And you compare that to what Jesus said in the Great Commission in Mark the 16th chapter, beginning verse 15. He said to them, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. There's no salvation outside of Christ. All of our morality can't save us because it takes that one sin to separate us from God. That sin has got to be taken out of the way and we have to believe and be baptized. Just like Peter said in Acts chapter 2 verse 38 to the Jews that killed Jesus when they said, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Peter said, Repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit which is the salvation mentioned back in chapter 2 verse 21. Salvation is in Christ. John chapter 14 and verse 6. There is no other way to the Father. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. Morality won't save us. It's necessary. We must be good, moral, upstanding people. But it won't save us outside of Christ. And we see also that lukewarm church members are going to be part of the population of hell. In Revelation chapter 3, where Jesus is giving a message to the seven churches of Asia. He says to the church in, in Laodicea, beginning in verse 15 of Revelation 3, says, I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot. I could wish you were cold or hot. So then, because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. Because you say, I am rich, have become wealthy, and have need of nothing, and do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire that you may be rich and white garments that you may be clothed that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed and anoint your eyes with salve that you may see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chase and therefore be zealous and repent. Lukewarmness will cause us to go to hell. And that lukewarmness, that's talking about folks that are satisfied with their condition. Pat themselves on the back my football coaches used to call it silly satisfaction. That's when you got the lead at halftime. And you end up going out flat in the second half because you think you got it wrapped up, but you're not done yet and you end up getting beat. Lukewarmness is silly satisfaction. Be thou faithful until death, and I will give you the crown of life. Revelation chapter 2 and verse 10. Jesus tells us. We have to be zealous for God. We have to work. Labor diligently, not that we're earning salvation, don't misunderstand. But he is the author of eternal salvation to all who obey him, Hebrews chapter 5 and verse 9. And if we don't obey, if we don't actually do the will of his Father in heaven, we've said Matthew chapter 7 verse 21 a couple of different times tonight already. If we're not doing the will of his Father in heaven, then we're lost. Being lukewarm, not working, not being zealous. Not understanding where we stand before God causes us to lose our souls. People who refuse to do good works are going to be in hell. Matthew 25, beginning in verse 41, 
He will say to those on the left hand, the goats, remember this judgment picture that we're seeing here, the sheep is being separated from the goats. He will say to those on the left hand, depart from me, you cursed into the everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and you did not take me in. Naked, and you did not clothe me. Sick and in prison, and you did not visit me. Then they also will answer and say, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not minister to you? And he will answer them saying, Assuredly, I say to you, and as much as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. Again, good deeds, works of righteousness, Titus 3, 5, they don't save us. It's the grace of God that saves us. But if we think that we can be saved without doing these works of righteousness, we deceive ourselves. Because we are that one slave whom we obey, whether it's sin leading to death or obedience leading to righteousness. Look at the standard here that Jesus uses. This is part of what Jesus is going to use as a standard of judgment. How did you treat folks? Did you do what you could to help? If we didn't, we're going to be one of those goats. Those who don't know God are going to end up in the lake that burns fire and brings. So 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, beginning verse 7. To give you who are troubled rest with us when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels and flaming fire, taking vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, these shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. Those that don't know God. Paul says in Romans chapter 1 that they are without excuse. Because we can tell that there's a God from the things that have been made. The creation testifies to God. And we have to listen to that testimony. God is a rewarder of those who diligently seek Him. Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 6. Without faith it is impossible to please Him, for he who comes to God must believe that He is, and that He's a rewarder of those who diligently seek Him. Jesus said, Seek and you will find, in Matthew chapter 7. In Him we live and move and have our being. He gave us our pre-appointed boundaries and times, as Acts chapter 17 tells us, so that we might seek Him, grope for Him, and find Him. He's given us a revelation of His Son. We're without excuse. If we don't know God, we'll end up in hell. Romans chapter 1, verse 16. Paul said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it's the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. Go into all the world, preach the gospel to every creature. Mark chapter 16 and verse 15. We have to get the word out there. People that don't know God are going to go to hell. Romans chapter 10, verses 9 and 10. Paul said that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. With a heart one believes unto righteousness, with a mouth confession is made unto salvation. We've got to teach people so that they'll make that good confession. They'll have the faith that they have to have. We've gone through a pretty lengthy list here. John writes in Revelation 21 and verse 8, The cowardly, unbelieving, abominable, murderers, sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. That's where the majority of man is going to end up. But we don't have to go there. Because God has made a way. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believed in him should not perish but have everlasting life. God loved us while we were yet sinners. Christ died for us, Romans chapter 5. And if we'll do what he says, then that promise from John chapter 14 that we mentioned earlier, verses 1 through 3, that he's going to come again, he's going to prepare a place, he's going to come again and receive us to himself, that where he is there we may be also, if we'll obey him, that promise is ours. If you're here tonight and you haven't done it, do so. Believe that Jesus is the Christ. Repent of your sins. Confess Him before Him. Be baptized in water to have those sins washed away. The Lord will add you to the church, that body of the saved, and you'll have the hope of heaven. Never done it, do it tonight. And if you're here and you're a child of God and you haven't been living the way you should, 
Maybe you let sin creep back into your life. <clears throat> Maybe you are lukewarm and you just need prayers and, and strength and encouragement from the brethren here. Stand ready to offer that as well. Whatever your need might be, why don't you come forward and make it known. All together, we stand and sing.